Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph and GP of Flex Capital. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. My, de- my guest today is David Sinclair. David Sinclair is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and the, father- and the founder of the Sinclair Lab. He wrote the book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To, which I've read and I highly recommend. He also founded several biotech companies, including Inside Tracker, Cobar, Cantata Bio, Life Biosciences, and Metro Biotech, which is a lot. Uh, David, welcome to World of DAS. All right. Thanks for having me on. It's nice to meet you. I'm very excited. Now, um, I've heard you say that there's no biological law that says we have to age, which is which is a pretty radical statement. Break that down for us a bit. Uh, well, we, we tend to think that what we see is inevitable. Uh, and it used to be the case for the speed of humans on the planet. We used to think that horseback was the fastest humans could go. We used to think that uh, when you got an infection from a splinter that went gangrenous, that was the end of that limb or death. Uh, we used to think that childbirth was always going to be potentially lethal. Uh, these things we, we used to think were inevitable. Now we're in a, in a world where I'm trying to let the world know that aging is no longer inevitable. Um, and in, I'm a biologist, I'm a geneticist at Harvard, where I've been studying this for uh, close to 30 years now. And there's been no evidence from my lab or any lab around the world that has found evidence of any mechanism that tells us that we must age. There are processes that we've identified that happen over time, uh, but we found that those are highly malleable. We can slow them down and even in the last few years, almost completely completely reset the system and reverse aging. And so I, I challenge anyone to correct me when I say that aging is not inevitable um, and also that there is a limit to human lifespan. Where's the evidence for that? There are plenty of species that live a lot longer than we do. And genetically, they're not that different from us. And with the technology that we have today, like let's say we stop developing technology today, what do you think the upper limit is of how long people can live? Well, with today's technology, uh, if you have the means, uh, I actually think we're pretty close to being able to prevent most cancers and heart disease and diabetes. So those major killers are already largely preventable. Um, And I'm including things like DNA tests for cancer and MRI scans. So not everyone can afford those yet, but surely they hopefully will be able to. So if we stop technology right now, I think that with a good diet and that knowledge and lifestyle, uh, the average person could probably make it to 95. You know, there are plenty of people who don't have the the knowledge or the means to do the right thing. And that's one of the things that I'm doing is education. Um, But I think that we're about to completely blow past human uh, longevity expectations and history of longevity. So right now, people who don't look after themselves bring the average down. There's COVID, there's drug addiction. Uh, That brings the average down across the planet, especially in the US. And uh, so the average is, is almost 80 years old here. But those people who um, look after their bodies from an early age uh, and do the right things and live long enough to to be able to reap the benefits of today's technology, um, not even the future ones, um, can expect to live into their 90s. Uh, My father looked after himself late in life and he's now 84 and as healthy as he's ever been in his whole life. So these are the this is what people can expect now, even with today's knowledge and technology. And where do you think like we're, we're, you said we're kind of like at the point where we're hitting some of these breakthroughs. What are the big breakthroughs that have to happen to go from, let's say people living into their nineties to people living into their one fifties? Well, they're happening in real time. Actually, uh, every week there's another breakthrough, uh, in aging research. It's, it was a slow field when I started in yeast cells, we were excited to make a yeast cell live 30% longer. That's 1995 technology. Uh, things are happening at a rapid pace. We've got the discovery that there's a backup copy of youth in every cell in the body that can be tapped into. Uh, we're curing my lab and companies that I've started and others that are competing with mine or at least uh, friendly competition uh, are showing that that it's not that difficult to reverse the age of an animal. Um, 
we've done this in mice many times now. It's not that difficult. A high school student could do it with the knowledge that we have now. Um, we're at the point where we're awaiting uh, next week, we'll announce results in monkeys for age reversal. We're curing blindness using this technology out of my lab. So we, we you know, I would say that the Wright brothers are flying already. Do we have commercial air flight? Do we have a Concorde yet? No, but we know it's possible to fly. So it's really not a question of, of uh, if anymore. It's just a question of when these technologies become widely available. So what's going to, what has to happen? We need to figure out a safe way to reprogram tissues in the body and eventually the whole body. Uh, we already have done some clinical trials in my companies. We have positive human data that shows that we can slow down and reverse some aspects of aging. Biochemistry in the body can be reversed, such as cholesterol levels, blood pressure. These are all doable with today's technology out of my lab. Um, there's a new technology, which is even better than that, uh, which uh, is a little, little bit behind that. We haven't gone into humans, but we are in monkeys, as I mentioned. And that, in the next two years, will treat our first patient. Uh, it'll be uh, to cure blindness. Um, and so, you know, the answer really is that I think we've already made a lot of the breakthroughs that can extend human lifespan by decades. Um, getting to 150, I don't think those breakthroughs are that far away, given how fast the field is going right now. The investment in the billions of dollars into not just labs, but in particular industry that has burgeoned just since our paper in 2020, showing that age reversal is it, safe age reversal is possible. So I'm, I'm 49 and let's say relatively healthy, like what, what, what's a prediction and, and have, have some money I can spend on some of these things. What's a prediction for the average person like me? Like how, how, how long is somebody like me going to live? Do you think? Yeah, I, I think you need to throw away any uh, preconceived ideas by looking at your parents and certainly your grandparents. Uh, we are going to live very different lives. We're actually approaching a big inflection point for those who are alive when these technologies come on board in the next decade. Um, so the point is, if you know, you, you're young, uh, Aram, but some people who are in their 70s, 80s and 90s, you've got to stick around, do your best to live as healthy as possible, seek the best medical care, uh, get scanned if you if you want to detect cancer, invest in your health is the point. You know, you can invest in coffee every morning from a certain store down the road, or you can invest that same money and afford a, a, an MRI scan for cancer. So stay alive uh, for yourself at your age. Uh, things are going to happen rapidly. By the time you're my age, I'm now almost 54. Uh, the technology hopefully will be here that you can be prescribed a medicine uh, to not just slow down aging, uh, but reverse parts of your body for, for age, eyes, ears, uh, probably uh, other parts of the body. And, uh, and certainly within our lifetimes, we're going to see a dramatic change, not just in what we can do to the body, which I believe is going to be reset multiple times, but the approach of medicine, the approach right now of medicine and doctors around the world typically is, well, come see me when you get old and sick uh, and, and then I'll treat you. Yeah. Well, that's waiting till the end stages of aging cause problems. We call them diseases, but they're really the manifestations of this process called aging, which we now understand is a universal process across the body and the same, same process in different tissues that we call Alzheimer's and diabetes and heart disease. These are all the end products of this same process of information loss in the body, which we call aging. And uh, those diseases are currently tackled at the end of life. We need to tackle them uh, early and doctors will have the attitude. And it's happening right now, thanks in part to people who have read my book and, and the wave of longevity science. They're looking at patients now, some of the leading doctors and saying, we can treat aging itself. We can start early. We could take someone in their forties and use today's knowledge technology to prevent that process, or at least to prevent it um, for another decade or two. And when you do that, then what happens is you stay healthier for much longer. And that's going to be a big shift as well. It's not just technology. It's the approach of medicine as well. And you mentioned these like things like getting MRI scans and some of these other kind of like tasks to uh, do early detection on things. And one of the, and I, I recently got a MRI scan, which I thought was very, very helpful, full body MRI scan, but I can right. imagine for certain people, um, there's going to be a lot of false positives with these things. And there's going to be other types of things to get people to worry. And the stress of some of these early detections may not outweigh 
like knowing about it? Like, how do you think about that? Or is it like, Hey, okay. If you're happen to be a more neurotic person, you have to work on that first. Or how do you think about when you're, when you're, when you're advising friends to do these things? Um, yeah, I think that that's a big mistake. And I've heard a lot of people say that and particularly doctors. Um, I think that that's, that's misguided for the following reason. There are plenty of tests that we do on pregnant women for children, looking at the risk of say having um, a, a child with Down syndrome. Yep. It's not proof, but it's evidence that we might want to follow up. Um, and same truth is true for these MRI scans. Someone who's young, uh, like the two of us, I regard us as relatively young. We want to get a baseline reading of what do we look like now? And then compare that every year and see what changes. It's the changes that are important. You don't go in necessarily. Yeah, and so have basically a you want to say like the deltas every year, every two years or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, and it's no longer just a doctor looking, comparing before and after. There's AI systems already commercially available that allow a machine to say, oh, that part of your body just changed in the last year. Let's take a look at that or monitor it a little more closely. Maybe you want to come in for a scan every six months to keep an eye on that. You know, it, it's not all about oh, waiting till you see a tumor. It's about knowing how your body's changing and getting ahead of that. And it's not just cancer that you see with these scans. You're looking at changes in your prostate size, your gut health, your bone health, your brain health, your blood vessels. All of these things are important to monitor changes of and get ahead of it before it actually becomes a disease. Now, uh, I'm having Brian Johnson on the podcast soon. He's trying to spend a couple million dollars a year to reduce his biological age. You're an avid tracker of your own biomarkers. Do you have like an official kind of figure for your own biological age? And how, how does one even like determine that? Well, there are lots of ways. Um, a very simple one is if you cross your legs and sit on the floor, how easy is it for you to stand up without touching the floor? If you can do yep. that, you're, you're doing well. Uh, someone middle-aged typically has to push themselves off with one hand. And if you're in your 80s, you might need to get onto one knee. That's easy, um, but that's not very accurate. The real data comes from blood tests or cheek swabs. What I've been doing for now a dozen years is monitoring my blood work. I don't do it that often. I'm not like Brian where I'm doing uh, you know, lots of different tests and taking lots of uh, supplements. But I do believe that without measuring anything, you're flying blind, like driving a car without a dashboard. And nobody would do that uh, who's sane. Um, and so take some blood tests. There are some ways to do that. You can ask your doctor or go to some of the commercially available um, tracking sites. I've been an investor um, and a, an advisor to Inside Tracker for many years. Um, and they've been looking at my blood work and they and I together developed an algorithm to estimate one's biological age using that. And according to that test, um, I'm in the top 2% of people of my age for youthfulness. Um, I'm about 10 years younger based on that than my actual age, so I'm 43. Um, there are other tests. There's DNA methylation tests. Uh, I launched a company recently called Tally Health, which is for testing epigenetic age, which is measuring your DNA uh, chemical changes. And so there are a variety of ways. There's no one test to rule them all. I'd like to do those two kind of tests to give me an idea of how I'm doing. But most importantly, it's about looking at the changes uh, and see how you're doing and trying to correct those errors or non-optimal numbers that can occur over time. And you want to adjust things. You want to be scientific about it. To me, it comes naturally. Of course, I'm a scientist. Um, so you, you measure, change, measure again. That's the, the way to go about life, I think, and, and optimize your body. And often I'm asked, you know, tell me what to do, professor. Just tell me what pill should I take? Now, there are some rough rules, right. but really everybody's different. Everyone has a different genetics, different background, different lifestyle, different history, different parents, different environment. Um, and so you need to monitor yourself but I agree, you know, it's not easy to do what Brian does. There's no way everyone can afford it, let alone spend as much time on it. But for very little money, you know, investment like it, giving up a cup of coffee or the, the money that it would take to have a year's worth of those coffees, you can spend that on your own health and you'll reap much greater reward, uh, rewards than you would get from drinking a cup of coffee. And if you can afford it, do both. No, I, I read your book, Lifespan. I took extensive notes and actually changed a lot of my own behavior and would love to dive into a couple of things. One of the things that you got into in the book was this kind of idea of hot, cold. Um, and I, I had a little trouble just following the science of that, even though I now do it because it's fun. Um, 
why why is this kind of hot cold combination good yeah so the the big breakthrough um but well, one of the big breakthroughs in the field that i was fortunate to be part of in the 1990s was the discovery of longevity genes and they exist in all life forms except viruses uh and uh and viruses hijack them to inf infect us so that's you know still important there but yeah these longevity genes exist in yeast and plants that's also important plants that we eat have longevity activating molecules uh, but really the, the point is that these longevity genes we discovered in the early 2000s respond to biological adversity sometimes we call it stress but i don't think stress is the right word because it invokes psychological stress which is not what we're talking about we're talking about cells and tissues and organs sensing that the food supply or the environment or having to run away from a saber-toothed tiger or an invading army is dangerous and without danger our bodies are complacent we don't like to waste energy so we put our energy into building fat and uh and at the expense of um getting older um and and staying young so that the problem really is that our society is built to make us feel comfortable and take away any perceived threats to our survival we don't have to go hungry most of us we don't have to run if we don't want to even our suitcases have wheels on them we go up elevators and our body says perfect great i don't need to put energy into activating longevity genes um, and they don't and what we end up with is early aging rapid aging diabetes heart disease as a result of the lifestyle that we have which is an abundance rather than an adversity mimetic as we call it, as i like to call it uh, and so hot and cold those are similar to as exercise and fasting are that they invoke this defense response adversity mimetics and so you can do oh, so it's really so about just it's about the stress yeah um it and is. it's a it's a very uh and and doing hot and cold or doing like interval trainings or or um you know doing some sort of um some sort of fasting type of thing it's a very low risk way of of stressing your body Right. Well, you can always overdo it. If you stay in a sauna all day, you're probably not going to reap the benefits yeah. or if you freeze your body parts. Same with exercise, you can overdo it. And fasting, of course, if you don't eat for a month, it's probably not going to be good either. So, you know, you can always go too far. But the yeah. concept is called hormesis, which is what really doesn't kill you makes you live longer. And uh, and that's what I recommend people live by is that don't listen to the marketing uh, from companies that want you to eat as much as possible and snack between meals. Listen to your body, listen to me, hopefully, and others like me, like Mir Barzilai, my good friend, who say that you want to uh, put your body in a state where it, it it feels like it's working or feels like it needs something. And food and exercise and hot and cold are the best examples of that. On the interval training side, is it... Uh... It, obviously the stress is probably a really good thing. What else is, why, what is the other big reasons for this kind of like interval workouts and why they're better? Yeah, well, it's the shock to the system. Um, most of what we've learned is that you can, you can eat as much as you want during one meal, but then you, you taper it off during the day. Yep. Uh, same with exercise. You can sit around, but, but then you want to put your body into a, a hypoxic state where you're, panting and cannot carry out a conversation and it's mixing it up it's it's the contrast between relaxation and the hormesis the the adversity it's not so much the constant adversity which we know constant adversity is not as good as mixing it up athletes know this uh, people who train their brain know this um, and it's it's so that's the good news is you don't always have to be running on a treadmill slowly or walking to get the benefits, you can just push yourself hard for 15 minutes, three times a week and get really great benefits. Same with heat, same with cold, do it, shock the body, get out and do something else. Yeah. One minute cold shower or whatever, just something crazy. Yeah. You know, I will freely admit that I'm pretty lazy. I, I try to be a role model as best I can, but um, I often snack because um, I'm stressed. Uh, I often don't exercise. In fact, I rarely exercise like I should. Um, but I do know the science, and I do think that um, doing a little bit goes a long way. Now, one one thing you, um, you on the diet side, you you advised cured meats like cold cuts and bacon. Like, why why is that? Oh well, the, there's a lot of science about uh, nitrogenous uh, compounds. So those 
nitrates um, are damaging of, to DNA. And there are two problems with damaging your DNA. One is that it'll cause mutations to your genome, which is the digital information in the body. And that's a like cancer um, type of thing? Cancer is the main readout of that. We used to think it was also aging, but actually there's more and more research saying that it's the other type of information in the body that's more important for aging, which is the epigenome, the regulators of the, the, the genes. Um, and that's what we are manipulating in my lab to control the aging process forward and backwards. And so when you eat nitrogenous compounds, what you're doing is breaking chromosomes. Um, and that we've shown leads to aging because the body has to react to uh, fix that DNA. And in doing so, it eventually loses the ability to regulate the DNA itself. Okay, got it. Now you're you're a big fan of NMN. And before I read your book, I had never even heard of NMN. Why why is that good? Well, now we're talking about research uh, from my lab in the early 2000s. We found that the sirtuin longevity genes that we've, my team, and well, I should say my, my mentor's team, Lenny Garenti, uh, discovered sirtuins. So let me tell you about sirtuins. These are seven genes in our body. Some of us have better versions than others. And in general, it's it's found that they protect the body against diseases raging, raging from um, Alzheimer's to diabetes. Now, these genes are, get switched off over time. Their, their main role is to make enzymes that tell the body how to survive during adversity. So when you're exercising and dieting and in sauna, they come on, protect the body. But the problem is, as we get older, they become less active. And one of the biggest problems is that for their activity, they require a a little molecule in the body, a very abundant one called NAD. NAD is required for life. It's involved in chemical reactions, but it's also used as a sensor for the body of adversity. When we have no adversity, we're eating a lot and sitting around, NAD levels go down. That's true as we get older as well. So a 50 year old has half the levels of a 20 year old for NAD. Um, and uh, what we like to do is to boost the levels of NAD back up to youthful levels and mimic exercise, mimic dieting, or even enhance those modalities. Now we've even got um, human clinical trial data. I was mentioning one of my companies has done clinical trials already for the last few years. And by raising NAD levels, we can actually improve human health. And we hope that this will be a drug one day to treat diseases ranging from kidney failure to even COVID-19 survival. So what about NMN? Well, NMN is a precursor that the body uses to make NAD. And by ingesting NMN, we've shown in humans that you can raise your NAD levels by about two to three fold. Um, and that's beneficial uh, in humans based on clinical studies. Um, you know, when I say I'm a fan, you know, I'm, I'm not selling this stuff. A lot of companies claim that I'm involved with uh, selling it. That's not true. Uh, I spend fair amount of legal fees on trying to stop that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, any, any NAD boosters, as they're called, seem to be really beneficial. I take NMN, um, and I've been doing so for probably about eight to 10 years. And uh, so far, so good. I've only seen benefits. Some people ask about... And so, so basically, you're saying the goal is to increase your NAD. Um, one way to do that is through exercise. You can do that by fasting, sauna. Um, but there's this other way to do it is to is to take this NMN um, essentially it's a supplement and you, and, th and that can also boost your NAD. Uh, yes, that's what the science is saying and others have shown it improves six minute walk. So it's being used for performance, uh, endurance uh, and overall health. It's not proven that it extends lifespan. In fact, we've only just recently found it extends a mouse's lifespan and haven't published that yet. So it's early days. We still have a lot to, to go on, um, or to do at least. But, are there um, side yeah, effects for taking it or there, um, or does doing one thing make it harder to do something else or? doesn't seem to be. I mean, mice in mice, there's a couple of studies in some rare cases of genetically inbred mice uh, that don't have an immune system uh, that they, there's hints that cancer might spread slightly more frequently in a very small study. But these are mice that are inbred and have no immune system. So it's still full steam ahead with human clinical trials. There's been no adverse events in any of the patients that have been tested um, or the subjects, I should call them. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not yet ready to say that there's any known uh, or at least uh, tangible, provable risks that uh, 
you know, I want to be the first person to know if there's a risk because yeah. my father takes it, my friends and family take it, I take it. Um, so I'm not, I'm not selling it. I just want to know the science. But I do know that my father is too old to wait till 100% proof that this extends lifespan. You and I are getting to that point where we can't wait. Um, and so that's really what I'm doing is I'm educating the public about the risks and rewards. There are a couple of um, mouse studies that I want to point out. But, you know, uh, all weighed up, I think that uh, the risk right now for me and my family is it's worth taking that risk until until further notice. Now, you also take metformin um, and um, and um, like, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but res- was virtual. Like- Sorry. Oh, it was virtual. It was virtual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, and often I'll, you know, when I talk to my doctor, he's like, well, I, I feel like, you know, maybe you're a bit too young to take metformin. And maybe, you know, I, I, I often encourage my patients who are, let's say 60 or over, but it has some side effects and that it makes it a little bit less likely to build muscle mass and stuff like that. Like, how do you weigh some of those things? Uh, well, let's start with when should you start? Um, I had a, a real, um, heart to heart with my doctor when I was 29, I had super high cholesterol levels. And he said, I don't want to put you on a medicine because you're too young. And I said, dude, it, I don't want to wait till I get heart disease to go on a medicine, get put it on me, put it on, uh, put me on it now. So I've, I've always been of the philosophy that it doesn't matter what age somebody is, you treat everybody the same way, you know, within reason, of course, 20 year olds are a bit young for this kind of stuff. But if you're in your thirties and you want to uh, prevent heart disease, prevent uh, diabetes, I think that it's perfectly fine uh, under doctor's supervision, taking medicines that will prevent disease, especially when does these medicines are extremely safe. You do it under doctor's supervision in case there's a problem, but with metformin, for example, and certainly resveratrol, very, very, very rare that somebody uh, gets so sick that it's a problem. And it's it's always reversible as well. You just stop taking it if you get sick. So these are risks I think were, are worth taking. I don't prescribe anything. I don't even recommend anything publicly. So I would say, talk to your doctor. You know, it's if they say you're too young, I would keep fighting it. I would show <laughs> you the data. And if, if you want, there's always alternative doctors. Um, I just, I think that the, the argument that when you're young, it's too early. I, you know, I, w- well, I would. There's a, there's the a, a, at least, at least what I heard that there's this trade off of like, okay, it's hard to build muscle mass. Building muscle mass is very important as you get older. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, so you have to figure the trade. Well, it's frustrating to me as a scientist that when somebody says something in public or some a podcaster says it's a problem, it becomes locked into the public's consciousness. And unfortunately, nobody ever goes back and reads the actual paper that this came from. And that that was also true for the Women's Health Initiative and breast cancer. People still believe that HRT causes breast cancer and uh, that turns out it doesn't. Same for metformin and ex- exercise. When you look at the data, uh, and it's really easy to see, it's not difficult, you can look at it. The graph that says there's a difference, uh, first of all, is being manipulated in a way that is deceiving. They cut off the y-axis so that you're just seeing the very tippy top of the bars. And the actual difference is about 5%. Um, And it turns out that that 5% is almost certainly due to people just not doing the extra couple of reps in the exercise because they feel a bit more tired. So what's the solution? Well, if you don't mind having muscles that are 5% smaller, then no big deal. Those muscles are just as strong and healthier um, and have less inflammation. I don't care if my muscles are still 95% there. I'm not trying to win any contests for bodybuilding, but I can also, <laughs> I can avoid metformin on days I work out, no big deal, or force myself to do a couple more reps when I feel tired. That's all it is. I wouldn't say that that's a reason not to take metformin. There are other reasons such as gastric, uh, in- gastrointestinal issues. That's more of a, an issue. But I think it, the point here that I want to make is Make sure that the science is true and the data that you're getting is true. Don't just believe pundits or even, uh, you know, doctors who are saying this stuff. Try to go to the paper, read it, or listen to scientists who do read papers. And also just measure yourself. Do it under doctor supervision. Make sure that it's not harming you. Make sure you feel fine. And then, by all means, in my view, 
it's worth starting in your 40s to maximize your lifespan because we're aging every day. It doesn't just begin after the age of 50 or 60. Now, initially, I, I was actually kind of skeptical to the idea that like big subsets of the population would adopt any of these anti-aging lifestyles. But then I saw a couple of studies that say 10% of Americans are already intermittent fasting every single day. Over 25% have already tried it. Maybe intermittent fasting is 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 not the best one to measure because it's it's kind of easy to do. You just kind of skip breakfast. And so it's kind of a simple, a relatively simple thing to do. But how optimistic that you actually will see widespread behavior changes? Well, we are in, in the midst of a revolution in um, people's wellness and how active they are in their own health. Uh, the pandemic was a major wake up call to people who stared in the mirror and saw their own mortality. And then there was a boom in home testing because people didn't want to go into doctor's offices for obvious reasons. And so it's becoming also easier for people to take home tests. Now, we don't want people you know, going rogue and testing themselves and trying to interpret themselves with chat GPT-4 and beyond. I don't think that's the only solution. I think there's a risk that uh, we won't have enough doctor's supervision and that some people will overdo it. Yeah. There's always that risk. So there's a caution here. I do think, though, that there's a place for people taking their own health into their own hands. You can't always be supervised by your doctor when you're at a restaurant. People do need to realize that most of what affects their health in the future is up to them, not their doctor. And what you do every day in your life echoes for decades. And that changing your lifestyle is as important, if not more important, than the medicines you will take. And that's why I think that this revolution that we're seeing in the population, not just in the US, but around the world, um, is a great thing and will only become more prevalent. And in 20 years, it'll be the majority of people will will be on board with uh, monitoring their own health. It's going to get easier and easier with devices as well, uh, cheaper and cheaper. And we'll look back at two years ago when almost nobody did this and think that going to your doctor once a year for an annual checkup and having the doctor bang on your knees and cough uh, will will seem medieval. In fact, even to us today, it seems medieval. Yeah, it's in, in the intermittent fasting one, it's while it's, you know, maybe uh, 10% of the population, it seems like it's it's probably closer to 40% of my friends. Oh, yeah. And, um, and one, I think one of the reasons is, well, besides the fact that it's, it's relatively easy to do, um, it's it's maybe one of the easiest ones to 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 do of of all the of all the things that people prescribe. Um, it's also also pretty easy to to sh to at least for people to believe that has low harm. Um, and because because if you say to somebody stop eating meat or something like that, first of all, I think that's hard for people to do because they they they, lo they might love their meat, and second, they may they may show you forty studies of how that actually could do harm to them. Um, whereas, and so, so it's, it's, it's kind of like there's both, uh, things that come in of why people may change behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and everybody's different. Some people like hot and cold therapy. Some people don't, um, yep. exercise is for some, it's not for me, although I know it's important to do. Um, and the same goes for fasting. I, I do agree that there's a real, uh, I don't know if it's fashion or a permanent trend for people to not eat the three meals a day that we were told to eat and snack in between. I think that's very 2010. We're beyond that now. Uh, most people realize that we're eating too much. Obviously, you can see it in people's waistlines. Um, and I think that that 10% is an underestimate that certainly in people who are taking notice of what's out the information that's out there. Um, yeah, in, in my circles, of course, it's it's 95%. But I think I, I meet enough people from the general public that it's way more than 10% that people are interested in their health. And I think that's also largely driven by the pandemic. People worried about getting sick and dying. I mean, what 30 or 40 year old ever had to worry about that before. Yeah. And so after that, in the, in the aftermath, people are just more interested in seeing what they can do now. And fasting is a pretty easy way to go to start skipping breakfast. A lot of people do that anyway, trying to have a very small lunch or skip lunch is another way to go. I like to eat within a six hour window at night, uh, have dinner. I'm, I often, uh, as I said, snack a little bit during the day, but that's my goal at least. And I compensate by drinking a lot of liquids that don't have sugar in them. Uh, and that helps. 
yeah, you know, it's it's an amazing thing to see how just in in my career, working on aging and talking about aging and talking about longevity and fasting went from total fringe in science to now mainstream in uh, not just science, but in the general public. Now, there's still some sort of visceral, often negative reaction from a lot of people to almost the concept of life extension. Some people think it's unnatural. Some people say it's selfish. I mean, you re you recently had this debate on Twitter with Elon Musk about it. Why do you think so many people have this kind of negative reaction to extending life? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that Elon is just secretly trying to cause a stir. Uh, watch, he'll flip pretty soon. But uh, there are still a lot of people who don't like the idea of lifespan extension because they were raised with the idea that while you can prevent diseases, preventing aging is somehow different. But actually, we found out that the biology of aging is the same as biology of disease. In fact, aging is the cause of most diseases. So trying to separate those two is it doesn't even make logical sense. But it's more about how we're educated that we wouldn't appreciate life if we were to live a lot longer. We know that's not true. You know, if you go back 100 years, did people appreciate life more because, you know, they, they could die from an infected splinter? I don't think so. I think that we appreciate life for the moment, surrounded by our family and friends. Um, and, I, I, you know, if, we, if you and I were going to live to 150, would we be enjoying this podcast any less? I don't think so. And so, and there's also the question of how long do you want to live? And most young people say, oh, when I get to 80, come shoot me. What they don't realize is that when we're, when they're 80, they're going to feel the same. They're going to love life, most of them. And yep. the, the last thing they want to do is someone to come uh, harm them. And that's going to be true increasingly in older ages. People who are 100 will not want to die. And it turns out if you're healthy and happy, literally nobody wants to die. Um, and that's increasingly going to be the case for older people. Are there like certain metrics or KPIs, like kind of simple ones that, you know, the average person should be collecting on themselves and either evaluating themselves or running it through some sort of yeah. doctor, AI doctor or something? Well, we're getting there. I don't know if yet of an AI doctor that, that you can trust. Um, I, I still think that going with a professional, whether it's your doctor or someone like me, um, my partner and I, um, business partner and life partner, Serena Poon and I, we advise uh, leaders of industry and, and, and athletes on this. Uh, you know, most people don't have access to me, but they do have access to information. Yep. My book, I would recommend my book is is a, a source of legitimate information on this topic. Um, that is a good place to start um, and to modify people, uh, one's lifestyle in a way that uh, we will stay alive until this new technology comes on board and it'll continue to get better. Um, so that's what I, I would recommend. Um, I think that if you don't measure yourself and you just take a supplement or you run a lot, I think the, you run the risk of overdoing it or damaging yourself. Your liver is susceptible. Your muscles can be overworked. Um, and so the metrics that I would say is uh, cortisol is a good measure of overall stress on the body. You wanna keep that down. Inflammation markers, keep those way down. Glucose levels, keep them below, uh, you know, 80 milligrams per deciliter, if you can, as a fasting level. Um, hormones, you want to measure and make sure your hormones are, are optimized. Vitamins, minerals, also optimal. And, uh, you know, optimal isn't always what a doctor would recommend. There's some tweaks that we do for our clients, uh, Serena and I. But overall, I think the average person with a, you know, a little bit of spend, a coffee equivalent a day can do a great job on monitoring themselves and using the internet and their doctor as guides. What, on on actually like trying things out, like wh what do you think about this idea of the right to try or the right to experiment with medications that are development and not yet FDA approved? How, how should we as a society have access or use those things? Yeah, well, it's an evolution. Whatever's new, there's a lot of people that push back. Uh, can you believe that when I was in my 30s, taking resveratrol from plants uh, was considered crazy? Uh, I was criticized for doing that and criticized for talking about it. Um, so, you know, I think that it, there's a lot of pushback on things that are on the cutting edge. Um, I do definitely believe that it's personal choice. There's nobody forcing you to 
to look into metformin and resveratrol and NMN and take those things, I think that what I suggest is educate yourself. It's not, don't just blindly take this stuff, uh, read about it. Um, there's a lot of literature out there. My podcast is a source of information as well. It's called Lifespan as well as the book. Um, and using that information, um, then I think that you can tiptoe into there. You don't want to ch dive in and suddenly uh, do everything we're talking about today. You will not only fail, you might injure yourself. So change a few things, see how you do, see how you feel, see what your doctor says, see what your blood tests say, uh, and go from there. One of the things I admire about you is you, 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 you actually start a bunch of companies with the research. How do we, I would love to see thousands more, thousand times more companies that are out there being started with all this different research. How do we encourage more of this research to actually, or, or more people to be starting companies around this type of stuff? Yeah. See, the problem was that it wasn't considered science until recently, and most of the government's U.S. government's um, money for research went into disease cures and, and treatments. And they thought aging was not really a disease, though it's changing. And of course, I've, I've been shouting from the rooftops, aging is a disease for many years. Um, it's slowly changing. Maybe, maybe it's the disease. <laughs> well, it is, and it's the cause of disease as well. Uh, the government's slowly changing. You know, I would say we've gone from less than 1% of the NIH budget now to maybe one and a half percent. It's still very little, of course. And so a lot of the money that's coming into this field is from donations from large and small. $10 to my lab makes a difference. Um, and there, you know, of course, there are big philanthropists that are putting some money into making drugs, which cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's the extremes. But even just a few hundred thousand dollars in my lab makes a huge difference. We can make a, a an historical discovery about molecules that can reverse aging in my lab. And that's really true for science. It starts small with a graduate student doing some research and it can explode into something that's as big as the discovery of the internet or, uh, or the, it wasn't discovery, the, the, uh, the engineering of the internet is probably a better yeah. word, discovery of the transistor, discovery of antibiotics. These are pretty simple discoveries, but they change the world and they don't cost much money either. And can we encourage, somehow encourage more people to start companies, commercialize, or do this kind of dual academic slash uh, for-profit track or? Yeah, I think that unfortunately history, mostly through the 20th century, academics vilified scientists who did anything outside of the ivory tower. So communicating to the public was frowned upon, even talking to a reporter was not really becoming, uh, starting a company was unheard of. 25 years ago, if you were a young scientist, it's better now, at least it's acceptable. It's even acceptable to have a podcast, believe it or not. But uh, <laughs> there's not enough scientists who are, who are doing this. Um, they tend to think that they, they don't have the skills. Now, with people like me, I'm happy to mentor people who have uh, no experience in starting companies. It's important because not only do they, they don't even know where to start, but they can get themselves into trouble such as not filing intellectual property the right way or having investors basically uh, take them for a ride. These are things that used to happen. Um, and I encourage any young scientist who's got a discovery or even an older scientist who's never done this to reach out to people like me or me. Uh, and we're happy to mentor you in the mistakes that we've made in our careers mainly. So you don't have to make them yourself. From, from a healthcare perspective in the US, we're now spending about 20% of GDP on health and that keeps rising. It seems a bit unsustainable long-term, just the way we're approaching health. Like how, what do you think really, what, what do you think needs to change for us to build a more sustainable health system? Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest problem really is that we're, we're treating diseases after they occur and often to yep. us when it's too late. Cancer, the, the, the idea that you wait till you get sick from cancer is ridiculous. Uh, that, that's criminal and we still do it. Um, I, I asked my doctor to give me a prostate cancer test and he said, well, do you have a family history? No. Well, hey, do you have any symptoms? No. Well, I don't think we should do the test. And I said, why would I wait till I get prostate cancer to come see you? It's, it's crazy. <laughs> so 
That's the biggest problem with, with the healthcare system and the cost is that we're treating diseases far too late when it becomes very expensive. So prevention is really the, the method and it's becoming less and less expensive to detect cancer with just a simple blood test. Soon it'll be pretty cheap. Um, these scans, I think, are going to be more expensive. That's not available anytime soon to everybody, though I would tell you it's, it's only about a couple of thousand bucks to get scanned. That's a lot for a lot of people. But you know, c coffee, you know, I've said is expensive too. So you got to have your priorities straight. Um, that yeah. is where we're at. I think that the future really is that people will be able to afford increasingly these early detection systems and stay healthier for longer. Now you might say, well, wh who cares if people are healthy for longer? That's still expensive, right? Turns out it's not true. The longer people live, the less expensive they are when they die. Uh, as someone who's over a hundred, typically dies in their sleep from a heart attack or kidney failure or liver failure. That's what I would want. I don't want everyone to die, but I think that if you, if everyone can make it into their nineties or hundred, then we won't have those very expensive diseases that affect, affect people in their fifties, sixties and seventies like cancer. Now, a couple of personal questions. How do you think of yourself as more of an insider or an outsider? Because you're, you're often an outsider. You're, you're saying things that are going against the grain and people are, are criticizing you for it. But then you're also a professor at Harvard, which is a very insider type of thing. So you, you, you're an interesting person where you kind of marry both, both worlds. Like, how do you think of yourself when you think of those labels? I'm definitely an outsider, even at Harvard. Um, it, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a struggle. I, there were a few times when I thought they were going to kick me out. Um, for doing and saying things. Uh, fortunately, they didn't. I appreciate that they didn't. Uh, but I'm still seen as an outsider, even in my department. Who am I to write a book and have a podcast and talk about supplements? That's not becoming of a, of a world leading scientist. What's been fortunate is that I've been saved by the wonderful people in my lab who have been, been making, uh, you know, really history making uh, discoveries over the last 20 years. And I think for that reason, uh, I'm allowed a little bit more slack than, than average. Um, but, you know, I'm not in this to win prizes. I'm not trying to be, you know, the greatest academic ever. I'm trying to change lives. And if that means pushing the envelope and risking my career, I'm happy to do that. Cool. All right. This has been great. Last question we ask all of our guests. What conventional wisdom or advice do you think is generally bad advice? Um, that, that provide are provided by pundits or, or health professionals or who, who do you think? Any type of conventional wisdom about anything. What do you think is just like, okay, mm. people generally say this, but this is generally oh, bad well, advice. It, there's lots. I, you know, I'm writing my second book and I've got a whole list <laughs> of them. Uh, and I love these cause I, I like to be like, um, um, the, in, in sapiens when, uh, her, uh, Dr. Harari was talking about things that you think are real or not. So one of the, the big ones is breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Uh, we've got a lot of childhood obesity, thanks to that adage. I don't believe in that. I haven't seen a lot of data that says that that's true. Um, with, with, with a salad, you need some protein. Who hasn't had uh, a waiter come up to them saying, oh, do you want some protein with that? And I have to remind them that plants are full of protein. In fact, they're made of protein. So uh, plants are protein. How about that? Um, they just have a nice ratio of amino acids <laughs> that are more conducive to longevity than meat. Um, what an, another one would be um, let's see uh, that uh, you, you shouldn't feel hungry during the day. So there's been this idea that you shouldn't stress the body and um, and so th therefore we've been told that we should be snacking and keeping our glucose levels constant. Um, that's also wrong. Uh, having uh, small spikes in glucose is actually perfectly healthy as long as you have periods during the day where you're not absorbing a lot of sugar. Um, orange juice, uh, cereals, th those in industries are full of lies. Uh, you know, uh, you could just look at the cover of some breakfast cereals, not the cover, the outside of the box, where they say, you know, part of a healthy meal and all this healthy uh, breakfast. 
really that's not the case. So there's a lot of food in, in our su food supply that are marketed as healthy. They're full of fats and sugars that we know cause disease. And unfortunately, uh, at a very early age, we become brainwashed. Oh, this has been great. Uh, thank you, David Sinclair, for joining us on World of Das. I follow you at David A. Sinclair on Twitter. You're also very, very big on Instagram. I definitely encourage our listeners to engage with you in those uh, in those mediums. It was really great to talk with you. Oh, thanks, Aaron, for having me on. It's been great. Uh, I haven't been doing a lot of podcasts. I've been working on my own and my second book. I really wanted to come on, and thanks for having me. And brother, when's the second? Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the first person to read it. When's the second book coming out? Uh, well, uh, Matt LaPlante and I are co-writing it. Uh, we've got our first draft and I'm filling in a lot of facts. I like to have density in the books like Lifespan. And uh, so probably next year you'll see it come out. So 2024. All right. Uh, let, let's work towards that. I think it's, it's likely to come out about a year from now. Uh, but I, I'm not going to release it until it's as good or better than Lifespan was. Okay. Amazing. Well, I can't wait. It's really great to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Orion. Appreciate it.